Okay, I want you to tell me, Grandpa, what got you started thinking about coming to America? Well, my, my brother was here, you know. Uncle Toyn. Uncle Toyn, and so we, uh, we couldn't both go because uh, the, we needed to, had to, somebody had to, you know, uh, make a living for the folks because we were awful poor. So we couldn't both go. So uh, my mother and dad, they let my, oh, my younger brother go because he was not as physically fit as I was. This is the story of an immigrant family, the story of the Skipperords coming to America. It's the story of two brothers, Willem and Toynus, and their sister, Lancia. They hear amazing things about a land of promise across the ocean, a place where hard-working people can make something of their lives. It's the story, too, of their spouses, Nisha Verward, Anna Denbor, and Case Quack, and children and grandchildren, and you. Between 1889 and 1895, when our ancestors were born in Holland, the Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh produces some of his most iconic paintings, and the Eiffel Tower is built in Paris. Ellis Island is receiving the first of what will be millions of immigrants, and the silent film star Rudolph Valentino is born. Living in the town of Goutsward on the Korendijk, the Skilperarts are a large and growing family. Their life is hard on the Korendijk in southern Holland. For 25 cents a day, they work tilling the wheat and digging potatoes and sugar beets by hand. They are scraping by while many friends and neighbors are joining the Great Migration to America. Let her speak of opportunities to be had there. As young boys, Blim and Toynus join their father on the island of Tingamaton, where they gather reeds used to make cane bottom chairs, all the fashion in the early 19th century homes. It's hard work. Sometimes they sleep on the boats that float in the shallows waiting for the tide to go out so they can cut and bundle the reeds they wrap in willow twine. They earn five cents for each bundle. They live in a hut cooking their own meals. They ate a lot of pancakes. Their father often had to leave the family for a week or more at a time to find work. With nine or ten kids it was tough. They remember being hungry, so hungry. That week he made six dollars. I remember all those kids were standing there. My father gave him the money, six dollars. My mother says, six guilders. How am I going to make? And my mother started to cry and we started to cry too. I'll never forget it. Miles away in the town of Workendom. Five-year-old Nisha Verward lived with her mother, Wilhelmina, after her father died at age 47. She was youngest of six children. Her siblings were much older, and her mother, at the age of 47, supported the family as a seamstress, making ladies' lingerie with her eldest daughter in their own store. She said, I have a picture of me when I was five years old, and my hair was just as short as any boy's hair could ever be. They used to think in those days that if you kept the hair cut, it would get thick. My hair really got thick. In a one-room house with a kitchen and the beds built into the walls, just like bunk beds with doors. You opened the doors in the evening and hopped into bed, just like cupboards, you might say, she said. She had learned to knit in the first grade and at age 12 competed in a flower show with her brother John, raising geraniums and begonias, a time she remembered well. John had won some big prizes in these Dutch flower shows in Rotterdam and later raised peonies in America for a living. She said, 
I was going to show what I could do. Well, all along, mine were better than John's. They were doing real nice, and I was quite proud. But just a week before this show, there was a big hailstorm, and my flowers were c just completely ruined. What started you thinking about coming to the United States? When my brother John left for the United States. He, he left in, eight, in 1908. And I was only 15 then. But I said, oh, I said, I'm going to come there too. Oh, he made fun of me. Oh, what, what would you do there? <laughs> By the time she finished school at age 12, she could add sums in her head without using a pencil, a skill she carried over when she and Pop played Scrabble. She said, it's the same when we're playing Scrabble. I know right now that figuring in the head is great. Scrabble must be in the family genes. A.I. It's a three-toed sloth. Pass the buck, please. When she was about age 13, Nisha went to work as a maid in a large home and later lived with her sister where she helped the family for four years. She vividly remembered the stillborn death of her sister's daughter during this time. Little did she know that soon her life would take her thousands of miles away to an arid land so foreign to her upbringing. But when opportunity arrives, she snatches at it and goes for the adventure. One of Brother Toynus's earliest memories is the coronation of Queen Wilhelmina in 1898 and the great ceremony around the event. Even then he recognizes the hardships and inequities his family faces. He said, I made up my mind at age 10 to leave Holland. At the age of 17 he boards the Holland America liner Potsdam and heads for America with a hundred dollar loan from his parents. On board he meets Anna, one of five daughters of another Dutch family, the Den Boers, also from Goutswart. They are headed out west, destined to join other Dutchmen already settled in the rich and fertile Yakima Valley. During the ten-day Atlantic crossing, they become better acquainted. Greeted by the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, the Dutchmen are processed at Ellis Island like thousands who have come before them. Their names join the roster of millions of immigrants from throughout Europe, born in the 19th century and moving to a new land in the 20th century. Soon Toynus is working and earning good money. You can earn a lot of money here, but you should not stay here for pleasure, he writes. You cannot buy beer or liquor here, and there are only a few Dutch girls, but I think more girls will arrive. I enjoy myself quite well here. In addition to his new freedoms, Tunis writes about the bounty of fruit, apples, peaches, cherries, and strawberries. Willem had remained home, burdened by his family's debt to the baker. The family had no oven to bake bread, and his mother relied on the good graces of merchants throughout the town, something the proud William never forgets. What did your family think about you leaving? Oh, they didn't like it. Why not? They wanted you to stay well, and work? Well, uh, in the first place, uh, I was a breadwinner. <laughs> no money no going just fact. Oh. <laughs> no money going in. They knew that's the first thing. Uh -huh. It was all a lot of little kids yet. I was the oldest. Mm -hmm. And I told my mother, that, don't worry about it, I'm going to pay, pay that debt <coughs> and more. At age 21, he joins the migration to America, boarding the Rhine Dam in Rotterdam on April 8, 1911, with many other Dutch women and men. He had corresponded with a 17-year-old from Venlo, 
but they did not meet until they were ready to board. Nisha Verord was traveling to Sunnyside to work for a young family. Her brother had written her about a couple of fellows who were heading to America. Intrigued, she boldly wrote the man in Gautzwart. First, he always rubbed that in that I wrote the first letter, Nisha told granddaughter Susan during a 1979 interview. Soon they were walking the decks, where she is trying to avoid the attentions of another older gentleman. She needed to be protected from the wolves, Willem declares. When it comes time for the new immigrants to be processed at Ellis Island, Willem is delayed. A spot on his head lands him in the infirmary for two days. I was very depressed and the caretaker caught me crying, Willem said later. He asked me what troubled me. I told him I was afraid they would send me back to Holland. He spoke fluent Hollands and told me not to worry. I would be on my way to the state of Washington tomorrow. The next day he was taken to Grand Central Station in New York. Willem gives his ticket to a man he thought was a railroad employee. He took it and disappeared, Willem recalled. The train was about to leave and he still didn't show up. Finally, a German employee arranged for a ticket and put him on the train. Meanwhile, Nisha is traveling ahead with another Dutch woman and her children. After a five-day train ride on the Burlington Northern, they are told to get off at the Toppenish Station, instead of Sunnyside. No one is there to meet them. No one understands a word they say. They are surprised and frightened by the native population. We were hungry and asked for meat, but no one understood us, Nisha remembered. The waitress brought each of them a bowl of strange-looking stuff later identified as flakes, cornflakes. Eventually a German-speaking man offers to take them by horse and buggy to find other Dutch families around Zilla. They are just about to give up on their search when a girl came to the door, takes one look and says in Dutch, Are you Nisi Verward? It is Anna den Boer. Nishi had turned eighteen just a few days before. Later, when she is asked if she left Holland for more opportunities in America, she replied, Well, yeah, anybody that had spunk to go from Holland to America in them days, they had ambition. The two single brothers are reunited and two Dutch girls are becoming fast friends in America. The boys work for a area farmers, the girls keep house and take care of the children of other Dutch immigrants. On September 24, 1913, the couples marry in a double ceremony at the home of the Den Boers. The brothers begin to farm together on Edison Road near Sunnyside, and in parallel fashion they begin their families with two sons named in the traditional naming pattern after the father's father. On December 2, 1914, Willem Nisha's first son is born, and he is named Garrett, Garrett John, the John after Nisha's father. Only five years later, little Garrett would succumb to a fever thought to be the Spanish flu, an epidemic that brought death and fear to both Europe and America. The loss of this first son was devastating for Willem and Nisha. The First World War is consuming Europe in 1914, pitting one monarchy against the other. It dashes the hopes of others from Holland, including Nisha's mother and sister, from joining them in the New World. Sadly, Nisha would never see her mother again. America won't join the conflict until 1917, but the war provides farmers and workers opportunities at home. The brothers know they must have reliable horses if they are to be successful farming. TJ can't pass up an opportunity to buy a good te working team even though sometimes the transactions are less than ideal. One horse drops dead as he is bringing a pair back to the farm just after being purchased. Those old horses were just crowbaits, they would later recall. 
William purchased a horse and buggy just so he could come courting before they were married, Nisha remembered. Their admiration for horse flesh was evident their entire lives. Later, T.J. raised some fine horses, which he sold to the U.S. Cavalry during the World War I. William especially fancied the large draft horses that were so hard-working and reliable. When he died in 1990, his casket was drawn to the cemetery by a team of perfectly matched Clydesdales. Both couples have much to be thankful for. In 1915, they moved together to Grandview and continued to farm, and in parallel unison they welcomed more boys, and finally for each family, a girl. On April 20, 1916, John Cornelius is born to Nisha and Willem, John for Nisha's father and Cornelius for Willem's mother, Cornelia. Not only are the families family, their offspring are friends. Cousin Corny of the T.J. family and John become lifelong friends and kindred spirits. Together they help establish the Agricultural Museum in Union Gap and keep the old ways alive at demonstrations they give together well into their senior years. On August 9, 1917, Tony Andrew is born to Nisha and Willem, named after Brother Toynus and Brother Andres in Holland. Tony will join John in the fields and see the family through some tough times. He'll work the land outside White Swan with Alice, Steve, Dave, and Jan. He is thoughtful and observant, a repository of detailed family history up until his death in 2011. As the First World War winds down in Europe, America's fighting boys are coming home. With them they bring a deadly virus commonly known as the Spanish Flu. The pandemic clouded much of 1918 and 1919, spreading as far as the Arctic and remote Pacific Islands. It's estimated that from 50 to 100 million people worldwide died from the virus when it ran its course in early 1920. In the city of Yakima, a total of 6,000 influenza cases, or roughly one-third of the population, were reported. 120 fatalities accounted for 32% of all deaths in Yakima in 1918. Many more may have gone unreported. It's during this time, on February 1, 1919, that Wilhelmina Phoebe is born to Willem and Nisha, finally a daughter, named after Nisha's mother and sister-in-law. Nisha is thrilled to have a beautiful baby girl after three boys. She goes by the name Phoebe and becomes her mother's right arm and a beloved sister to the entire family, though she does marry a very tall guy and moves away to sunny California. She's the first to start a family and is a devoted mother, pastor's wife, with light spirit. She's the aunt living next to Disneyland, always with an open heart and an open door of hospitality. Meanwhile, Willem and TJ's younger sister, Lancha, has married the handsome Cornelius Case Quack, and they too want to come to America. In 1920, Case and Lena joined the growing Dutch community in the Yakima Valley. These photos are taken a few days before they leave for America. With their son Peter, they board the Holland America liner Kronlander in Rotterdam and, like their predecessors, sail the Atlantic. They live with Will and Nisha, arriving just a few months after the death of little Garrett, who succumbed to the Spanish flu on February 20, 1920. Nisha is pregnant during this time, and on October 11, 1920, the second Garrett is born, christened in honor of the boy they lost, preserving their father's names. Garrett is known as a thrill-seeker, as a boy, and an avid traveler and adventurer into his retirement. 
He provided much entertainment, blowing up an outhouse as a youngster, and in his later years canoed the entire length of the Yukon River and rafted uncharted parts of the Yangtze in China. Speaking no English, the older ones in the family soon begin school. In 1919, Willem, Anisha, and the children move to the Balma district, where they buy a place on what is now Holiday Road, one half mile west of the Mabton Sunnyside Road. Four miles separate the families. No longer can the two young mothers have tea and share time together. A horse has to be harnessed to the buggy. Four miles might as well be forty with all those kids. In 1921, T.J. and Anna and their five children move on to a farm on Edison Road, purchasing it for the unheard of price of $400 an acre. They drive there in a Model T Ford, which costs $700. In just ten years, poor immigrant T.J. is the owner of his own land and his own car. After receiving much teasing from the country doctors that it would be another boy, Nisha is delighted on July 18, 1922, when she gives birth to a daughter, Cornelia Marie, who has always been known as Connie. She quickly becomes a favorite in the family and of her brother's visiting friends. She has other ideas and finishes her nursing degree at St. Elizabeth's before being swept away by a California boy. In 1968, her nursing career helps her and supports her four children after husband Jack dies suddenly. Between the three families there are now six parents and twelve children, a clan in the making. With twins, T.J. and Anna have four sons and a daughter. For Willem and Nisha, there are three sons and two daughters. In 1921, Lena gives birth to Cora, who joins Pete. There are meals to be cooked, diapers to be washed, bread to be baked, laundry to be done, chickens to be fed, food to be preserved. There are toddlers underfoot and babies nursing, brows to be mopped, brush, bruises to be tended to, and illnesses that strike suddenly. Greater responsibility fell to the older children the younger children admit, more so perhaps to nine-year-old John, when in 1923 his father William is sickened by typhoid fever and fights a six-week battle between life and death. Nisha and John take over the farming and milking and all the accompanying chores. The home is quarantined. The younger children are boarded elsewhere except for nursing little Connie. Though a valiant effort, the Belma farm is lost and the William Skilperorts move again. In an, interview, in an interview with his granddaughter Susan in 1979, William related the crisis as it had never been told before. At the crisis that night, Grandma never knew it. But my spirit was up and was, I was looking at it, I had myself in the bed. Ooh, you don't believe me. that? I do, but tell me about it. It's just like a flutter, uh, like uh, static electricity. Just like a bird fluttering over the wings. And then up, I, I went up like that and I looked at, I was looking at myself. It didn't last long. That was the crisis. I came back to myself and the next morning I told Grandma, I said, the crisis is past. I feel better. It's during this time, on March 28, 1924, William Jr. is born, one day after his father's birthday. The same year he arrives, William Sr. acquires a Model T Ford. Bill is studious both at school and at home. He's the first in the family to go to college. Books become a love of his as he recuperates from childhood arthritis. He becomes a teacher and may well be critiquing the grammar in this presentation. In 1925, William's family moves to Maple Grove, northeast of Sunnyside, where John, Tony, and Phoebe go to school. 
Early in 1926, Carl Wesley is born on January 28, the seventh son to be born to William and Nisha. Carl is a devoted brother to his younger siblings and a star of the high school basketball team. As a youngster, he's charged with taking care of the calves. Later, he takes up the family farming business, growing delicious cherries, peaches, and nectarines. Also in 1926, brother Sanders Gilbert from Holland joins his siblings, T.J., William, and Lena. He has been persuaded by the glowing letters that America truly is the land of promise. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh makes the first transatlantic flight from New York to Paris. In 1927, Closer to home in the Yakima Valley, cousins number 21 and 22 enter the world stage. Dorothy is born on August 13, seen here with cousin Elsie Skilperort of T.J., who was born exactly one month later on September 13, 1927. They have been lifelong friends. Dottie is voted on by her father. She sits on his lap at the supper table. Apparently, she's one of the young Skilperoids who actually threw a tantrum. Both Grandpa and Grandma relayed in the 1979 interviews that the children rarely required discipline. Phoebe, John, and Tony were spanked once when someone plugged up the siphon at the Harrison place and no one fessed up. Another time, Phoebe had to wear overalls as punishment. And Bill was so repentant for one infraction that he dutifully carried in the wood without being told and carried out the ashes without being told. Dorothy cried herself to sleep after that tantrum and thought twice about it the next time, Grandma said. In 1928, the William Skips moved to a 200-acre farm on Evans Road. They choose to move on George Washington's birthday so the children won't miss school. The land is leased from Yakima tribal members. It lacks electricity and indoor toilet facilities. Fences are put up to keep out the wild horses the Yakimas herd down from the nearby hills. And Paul Robert is born to William and Nisha on March 26, 1929, one day before his father's 40th birthday. As the youngest in the family, Paul's feet rarely touch the ground as he's lovingly carried around by siblings. The love in the family is strong and the foundation is set early with Nisha learning to drive so she can be sure the children are able to attend Sunday school at the little church in Hera. He goes on to serve in the ministry, leading Young Life clubs and forging fellowships and friendships lasting a lifetime in Phoenix, San Jose, and Portland. By the 1930s, the children are speaking English at home. Their parents have adopted American names. While buy-in on credit has become en vogue, the Skilperorts pay cash. Because they are farmers, they ride out the Depression. There are no grocery stores as we know them today. The children are growing and becoming more than just family helpers. Both boys and girls take on more and more of the chores around the home and farm. They produce their own meat, raise their own vegetables, and make their own dairy products from milking their own cows. They sew their own clothes, can fruit kept in a cellar, gather eggs, wring the necks of their own chickens, and make beds and pillows from the feathers. They cure pork, ground sausage, render lard, and make soap. In the winter, the women knit and sew, darn socks, and embroider. The men fix the farm equipment. The women refer to the Practical Guide to Help, otherwise known as the Doctor Book, for home remedies and common sense care and training of children. Mom preserved each child's baby shoes as keepsakes they received when they were older. Pop always shaved from a tin pan, spreading the lather on his face with a bristle brush, and he enjoyed a cigar on Sunday.
More informal photos are taken of the children now. Nisha most likely snapped these shots of her youngest children with her Kodak box camera. Here's a rare shot of Nisha and Bill with Carl, Connie, Paul, and Paul in front of a towering haystack. In 1930, William managed to pay his debt, made possible after harvesting 102 acres of wheat, which sold for the top price of $1.31 a bushel, and 30 acres of potatoes, which sold for $52 a ton. You don't work, you don't eat, he often said. Moving to the reservation had paid off. Pop is a good farmer, that's for sure, Nisha said. Their solvency allows William to return to Holland, where after 19 years he finds his mother and father still in good health. Nisha manages at home with the help of a hired man and her older daughters and hard-working sons for three months. Some of the children thought I should go too, but the children were too small to be left alone, and besides, his parents were both living, and mine weren't. I have never felt bad about that. I wanted him to go, she said. Just five years after arriving in America, Sander returns to Holland, taking with him the Gettysburg Address and the preamble of the Constitution in his heart. Later he marries Yanni, and cousins Gert, Cora, and twins Kos and Sander are born. By 1935, Pop has bought the place in White Swan and has three hired hands. With John and Tony, they work the place. They have seven children in school, and Mom gets up early to make lunches for all seven children, plus the six men. She sends up a hearty lunch with the men, something that would stay hot for them. They left at 6.30 in the morning. Imagine doing that nowadays. No 7-Eleven for coffee, no McDonald's egg muffins, no frozen meals or microwaves. Here the kids are with, at the Johnson School with Mrs. Norton. Find Garrett, Connie, and Bill. Still, the families begin to enjoy emerging new technologies. Cousin Harry Quack remembers. Pop always sat in a rocking chair in the living room. He would peel apples for everyone, and we would listen to Lum and Abner, Amos and Andy, Jack Benny, I Love a Mystery, and other evening programs. He would peel apples and take pride in having one continuous peel when finished. In 1937, the William Skilperorts finally get electricity. There are now lights in the house, barn, and the yard. Out went the old wood stove. In came a genuine electric range. The new radio doesn't need a battery, and the console includes an automatic record changer that plays both 78 and 33 RPMs. A fully equipped indoor bathroom is added along with an electric hot water tank. The front porch is turned into a bedroom for the girls. A beautiful blue wall-to-wall -wall carpet in the living room adds a touch of luxury, and a few coats of white paint and green trim transform the outside, too. In 1938, the couples T.J. and Anna and Bill and Nisha celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary at the T.J. home in Sunnyside. And at Christmas in 1938, the combined Skilperot Quack family celebrate at Uncle Will's house on Evans Road. All that remodeling needs to be shown off. The younger ones are finding their cousins are built-in friends. There are seven cousins of corresponding ages. Over a period of many summers, different ones of us would go to stay for a week with Sunnyside Skip cousins of a corresponding age, while one of them would come stay at our place, recalls Dot. The 50-mile journey was an awesome event, and these vacations were anticipated like Christmas. 
For us it meant the glorious opportunity to go swimming in their canal. It meant sleeping upstairs. It also meant work, helping take care of the chickens and eggs, weeding the asparagus, helping prepare meals, and doing a mountain of dishes. and corresponding boy cousins four boy cousins 16 boys in all by now some of the older cousins are married and starting families Phoebe to Glenn O'Neill and soon Dale and Donna become the first grandchildren for Will and Nisha The children are all now young adults. There are new innovations, automatic washing machines, a Bendix washer for the TJs, and a ringer for the Williams. In 1937, Kiss and Lena returned to the Netherlands to visit their loved ones. It has been 17 years. In Europe, Hitler is rising to power. Soon Holland is overrun by Nazis. In 1940, Rotterdam is decimated by war. Food is scarce. The Germans retaliate harshly to those who take advantage of airdrops from the Allies. Many Hollanders bravely serve in the resistance and hide Jews from the Nazis. Their suffering is great, but thankfully Opa and Oma Skilperort and all the brothers and sisters survive the war. It leaves an indelible mark on the younger cousins like Willie Decker and Garrett Vanderhoven. Willie will keep a menorah in her home so she'll never forget, and Garrett often recalled the hardships they suffered during the occupation. In America, the boys are no longer just boys. They are men. The United States enters the Second War in 1941, and the Skilperort men clamor to join the armed services. In all, nine will serve. None more valiantly than T.J.'s son Clarence, who survived the sinking of the USS Houston near Java and the horrors of prison camp in Burma. He had joined the Navy with his twin brother, Lawrence. John, Tony, and Bill were Navy men, too, while Carl joined the Marines. Over the years, the immigrant couple's ties remain strong. They mark many important occasions together, their 40th and 50th wedding anniversaries and yearly holidays. In 1943, all three families gather on the 4th of July at T.J. and Anna's house in Sunnyside. It's the first of what becomes an annual tradition in July, the family picnic. The food looks just as good then, maybe even better than today. Thirty-three of a possible forty-one of the skill broads and quacks are present. In 1948, word comes from Holland. Opa Garrett Skilperort is dead at age 88. Oma Cornelia Poldervart Skilperort will live eight more years, passing away at age 89 in 1956. In 1949, Nisha and William make a trip to Holland, her first since leaving in 1911. They spend six weeks there. Nisha meets her mother-in-law for the first time. Through the late 1940s and early 1950s, their children begin establishing families of their own. 
A girl from Ohio is swept away by the bold red-headed Garrett, and Tony woos Alice via letters to Minnesota. In California, Connie meets and marries Jack Siemens, and little sister Dottie comes down for a visit. Carl weds a beautiful younger Sela girl, the Helen Youngrid, and Dot marries C.E. Redfield after working together at Dufour, Oregon, having both graduated from Linfield College. Rini snags her man Paul and joins him as he attends Dallas Theological Seminary, and Bill marries Ruth, the spunky Canadian he met as a friend of Rini's. John and Vera tie the knot after they meet at a drive-in restaurant where she was a car hop and he hung out with other boys after the war. She had transferred to Whitworth College from Biola and got a job in Yakima thanks to a friend who offered to let her stay for the summer. In this picture, sisters and sister-in-laws, Ruth, Dee, Helen, Alice, Phoebe, and Dot pose together expectantly. Here come the baby boomers. Carl and Helen, here with first child, the darling Colleen, at three months old, taken after her dedication on Easter Sunday, and Dave, Steve, and Janice posing for the traditional 1950s Christmas card. Soon Nisha is surrounded by a whole passel of granddaughters shown here in the summer of 1953. There are just as many grandsons or more, but the female showing in the family is a welcome change. By now, Bill and Nisha are known as much by Grandpa and Grandma as they are Pop and Mom. They move to a house they built on Brownstown Road, which becomes a centerpiece for family gatherings in years to come. Emma is still ready with her Eastman Kodak camera to record important events. Mira's grandchildren are Philip and Tim, sons of John and Vera, who live and farm on the Evans Road. Christmas 1962 brings other grandchildren and cousins to the farm. where they pile on Grandpa's lap and teeter on Grandma's knee. Those far away send yearly greetings, Phoebe and Glenn, Paul and Rini, Bonnie and Jack. And once in a while, the folks at home take a trip. Here, John and Vera, Manya, Tim, and Phil. Dot and C.E., Bill and Ruth, and Carl and Helen's kids. and the little latecomer babies in color. They enjoy tea time with grandma and older cousins and friends. And of course, we all survived the 70s.
In 1967, the six brothers, Garrett, Tony, John, Paul, Carl, and Bill, are still handsome and fit. They have 19 boys and seven girls among them. Like their father, they know the value of work, but they also enjoy good company and play. Garrett launches caribou ranches and with his four boys farms potatoes, mint, and asparagus. He builds a barbecue spit and invents the Young Life barbecue beef sandwich that's sold to this day at the Central Washington Fair. Tony farms the White Swan property until moving to Toppenish and selling real estate and insurance. He enjoys taking photos and duck hunting with his boys as well as tending his garden. John remains on the old place farming wheat, corn, and potatoes. He is working in the shop on old engines in his spare time and stops in every day for coffee and tea time with mom and pop. Philip, Tim, and Danny all take turns on the tractor, but it really sticks with Tim who has his own farm service company today. Paul is living in San Jose after a stint in Phoenix with Young Life. He's got six boys of his own, and even though they're city kids, they've been raised on the same work ethic of the farm, with some good old youth group fun thrown into the mix. Carl farms with John, Tony, and Pop, and later with other partners on the south side of a Tannum Ridge. His four daughters manage him quite nicely. Nice is the operative word for Carl, whose outgoing personality has made him well known throughout the valley. Bill is a fixture at 1313 North 77th near Green Lake in Seattle. He teaches English and literature at Bellevue High School and hosts nieces and nephews attending college and friends and relatives visiting from far and near. He can expound on the pound of flesh from the Merchant of Venice as easily as espousing the merits of Pike Place Market coffee. By 1968, the Vietnam War is raging and protests are mounting. In April, the civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated, and in June, Senator Robert Kennedy is killed. For the Skilperorts, a triple tragedy unfolds. Sister Adriana and her husband Ari Vanderhoven are staying with Case and Lena Quack for the summer. It's hot and they go for a drive in the air-conditioned car up on the he Horse Heaven Hills where they can see the lights of the valley stretch below. On the way Adriana and Lena sing old childhood songs. It was a very special moment and they had no way of knowing that it was to be their last time together, Delpha Vanderhoven recalled. The next day Aunt Lena collapses. She dies on July 9, 1968. Just three months later, on October 9, 1968, her beloved husband, Case, passes away. Off and on that same year, T.J.'s wife, Anna, had been ill and in the hospital. It had been difficult caring for her, and T.J. was very tired. But on discovering that she was not in bed, he went looking for her. Barely awake and a little impatient when he found her downstairs, he asked, Now what, Mama? What do you want? Just you, Papa. Just you, she looked at him and said. She died a few weeks after Lena. Now there are just three of the original pioneering immigrants. Even so, they lean on each other for support. T.J. continues to travel, visiting his children in California and again in his homeland in Holland before he dies at the age of 83 in 1975. Mom and Pop, Grandma and Grandpa, Tante Anisha and Uncle Will become the focal point of the family gatherings that follow. As Grandma said that next summer in 1976 in the Yankee Corn Dr. Diker, As I look back to our first family reunion picnic, I felt it was the beginning of a nice fellowship for all concerned, and it has become more so as the crowd got bigger. Much has happened in the meantime, but I feel the Lord has blessed us very much. We will miss the ones who have gone. That means that Pop and I are the only ones left of the original group, and we hope to be with you for quite some time. But if not, we wish God's blessing on all of you, and we love you all.
In 1983, William and Nisha celebrate their 70th wedding anniversary at their farm in Brownstown Road. They are now in their 90s. Most of their family, 39 grandchildren and 29 great-grandchildren, are in attendance. Their immigrant story is featured in the Yakima Herald Republic. Together, like their immigrant siblings, they have made more than a life in America. He's harrowed fields with a team of horses and watched a man land on the moon. She's raced an automobile, loaded with kids to church, and mastered a microwave. They learned a new language and tamed the harsh landscape of dust and sagebrush, and like T.J. and Anna and Lena and Case, built a legacy that lives on in their children and grandchildren today. Mom and Pop in the Original Nine and their spouses. Nisha lived one more year after their 70th anniversary celebration. Suffering a stroke, she died at age 91. Her legacy was great and her prayers were always for strength and for her family. Going to the hills was something that Grandma endorsed when the children were young. We went to Sunday school and church Sunday morning, and then in the afternoon, if the kids wanted to go up in the hills, then that was all right. Then at least I knew where they were, she said. And Anna didn't approve of such things. But it paid off, she said. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. Each of us has fond memories of going to Mount Rainier for picnics, camping, climbing, and hiking with aunts, uncles, and cousins. It's something embraced by the third generation, here represented by Nathan, Andy, Katie, and Sarah. Now Grandpa, or Uncle Will, is the patriarch of the Skilborough family events. His vigor never wanes. At the age of 97, he takes one last trip to Holland. Bill and Kim Skilborough escort him back to the Isle of Tingamaton, where it all started, where the dreams of coming to a new country began. His life is celebrated in style with a huge gathering of friends and family as he turns 100 on March 28, 1989. With a firm handshake, he greets dignitaries and congressmen and is feted at a banquet hosted by the governor with other centenarians. All nine of his children are in attendance and relatives from Holland, too. but nothing pleases him more than to be serenaded by his grandchildren and to dance with his granddaughters. As Paul said in opening up the event, we have come here today to honor you and give our respect not only for the hundred years of a full and rich life, But because we love you and are grateful for the legacy, the heritage you are passing on to your family and the world. Some will continue to duplicate your tenacious, daring, adventuresome, and pioneering spirit. As evidenced in your striking out for America as a young lad. and for taking the risk of failure as you pioneered in a new, strange, and different world. Still others will pattern their lives after your thirst for knowledge.
and that sharp, keen mind with an amazing propensity for grasping and retaining vast amounts of detailed information. All of us will remember that you taught us the value of hard work. So much so that some have had difficulty in learning how to play. And standing before you, 39 of your grandchildren. The party continues afterwards at the farm. Here are the Hollanders, Willie, Yak, Cora, and Gert, around the kitchen table. After party coffee with Connie, Phoebe, Willie, and Garrett. And bidding farewell to the California cousins. William marks his 101st year in the hospital after contracting pneumonia in California while visiting his daughters Phoebe and Connie. He dies on May 20, 1990 in Anaheim, and his body is shipped home to the Yakima Valley, where he is buried on a June day at the Reservation Cemetery next to his wife Nisha. A voracious reader and self-made scholar, he could quote the theologian Luther as clearly as he could the philosopher Lucretius. He admired Dutch folk Jewish philosopher Spinoza, born in 1632, who first pondered that God and the universe are one. Life after death was the ultimate mystery, he said. He and Nisha were like oil and water on such topics, but they talked about it, and in the end, had a loving understanding and respected each other. As you were over here experiencing the pressures of being in debt, did you ever have second thoughts about wondering why in the world did I come to America? <laughs> yeah, I sure did. But yet, though, I wouldn't, oh, no, I wouldn't uh, change it on a bet. No, mm -mm, because we had, it, it, this land gave me the opportunity, and I figured uh, uh, it was up to me to make the best of it. Mm -hmm. and I did. I didn't give up like some of them did. This land is a wonderful land. I love this land. And uh, no, mm -mm. I never blamed the land. I never blamed anybody. It was me. It was my fault. Ignorance, that's what it was. And not to some bad luck too. But a lot of it was ignorance. Because uh, when you were brought up as poor as I did, never owned anything and uh, not too much of an education, you, you have an uphill business, mm -hmm. and uh, you have to learn by uh, trial and error, and there was lots of errors. <laughs> well, afterwards, it's all right to see, to look at, after, after hindsight, the hindsight, but mm -hmm. it's a foresight of what counts. His passing closes the chapter of the immigrant Skilperords coming to America. It's a story like so many who came to this country at the turn of the 20th century, those who came for a better life in a new land and who never looked back.